So the global asbestos revolution I hinted at in our first webisode really gained traction in the early 20th century. Manufacturing companies all over the world became fascinated with what had been known as a magic mineral because it was as useful as cotton but would never burn. With this fascination came a change of focus to all the possibilities and riches that this magical fireproof mineral could bring. For asbestos to be successful in the global market, however, for as many products these, as these companies invented, there needed to not only be a use, but a demand as well. And this demand came when the skies of Europe opened in 1914. So the infrastructure and means of the First World War radically changed much of the Western world, and asbestos was fundamental to this urban industrial transformation. With the introduction of new technologies of war came the sudden need for soldiers' uniforms to be fireproof. The horrors of war were already great enough that they did not want to add burning alive to the list of what could happen to you, and fireproof soldiers were quickly pushed to the front. It's also not surprising that being heavily bombed for four years convinced the civilians of Europe that having as many fireproof buildings, materials, and products as they could was crucial for their survival. Now the effects of the First World War were both tragic because of all that was lost and dramatic because of all that had changed. The war gave Canadian asbestos both a use and a demand, which is why, in 1918, New York's Johns Manville Company purchased the Jeffrey Mine. This was a company that specialized in building supplies made out of asbestos, and in the interwar period, the United States was becoming increasingly urban and modern with homes that were being powered by electricity, which, although an amazing new invention, was actually prone to burning your house down. In the process of helping make the nation both urban and safe, Johns Manville embodied the spirit of America at this time and brought a bigger is better attitude to the town of Asbestos. market for asbestos outside of American urbanization at this time was European post-war reconstruction. Johns Manville's main European competition was Turner Brothers Asbestos. Based just outside of Manchester, the cottonopolis of the world, Turner Brothers was in an excellent position to provide asbestos products to European markets. Much like Johns Manville, Turner Brothers purchased a Quebec asbestos mine, but theirs was in a rival community in the province's asbestos belt, Tetford Mines. Through companies like Turner Brothers and Johns Manville, Canada exported tons of asbestos to the United Kingdom, France, Germany, and any other country that had been bombed during the war, and knew that the fight was not quite over yet. That's right, even though Germany was technically a bad guy in the interwar years, Hitler made the German asbestos industry a national priority, and as long as there was a market for asbestos, Canada would sell it. revolution was gaining steam, another story was developing. Turner Brothers had been manufacturing asbestos products since 1879, and by 1924, Nellie Kershaw, a spinner of asbestos yarn for the British company, died of asbestos poisoning. Kershaw was 33 at the time of her death, and had worked in the industry since she was 12. She was forced to stop working two years before she died because her breathing was so restricted, which is one of the symptoms of pulmonary asbestosis, a disease you get when you breathe in so many asbestos fibers that they get packed in the fluid lining of your lungs, stiffening them until they can no longer expand and contract, you can no longer breathe, and you suffocate to death. So it might be helpful for you to picture your lungs as though they were two water balloons. This is a lung. Um, a healthy lung expands and contracts when it's breathing, so this is a breathing when you're breathing out, this is when you're breathing in. Out, in. Very healthy lung. Lots of fun. On the other hand, if you were an asbestos worker and your lungs had been filling slowly over a long period of time with asbestos fibers, it's as though you put that water balloon in the freezer. 
your lungs can no longer expand and contract easily and you know the balloon becomes a lot less fun. first recorded asbestos related death, the first official death, but she certainly would not have been the first person to die of exposure to the mineral, nor would she be the last. Kershaw was not compensated for her disease and was buried in an unmarked grave in Rochdale, England. Samuel Turner, one of the wealthy founders of Turner Brothers Asbestos, is buried in the same cemetery, just a hop and a skip away from Kershaw, but of course, he's got quite the monument to his importance. was the first time, but not the last time, asbestos companies like Turner Brothers and Johns Manville covered up the deadly aspects of the mineral, which was developing a reputation as something that would make the world safe. From the letters that were written between company officials and company doctors, it seems that as long as asbestos only killed members of the working class, there was no real cause for concern. saw money in Quebec's asbestos mines, and the province was open for business. By 1928, only 10 years after the Johns Manville Company had come to the town of asbestos, the Jeffrey Mine, once deemed insignificant, was providing 75% of the world's asbestos supply, and the market was booming. Just as the asbestos revolution was coming into its own, with new products and uses emerging all the time, another world war was about to break out, and Quebec's asbestos industry had to be ready. 